Can TCU sustain the momentum from that win on the road against Kansas? Can Houston get their first Big 12 win of the season? We'll talk about that and more next here on Locked On Horn Frogs and Locked On Cougs. It's a crossover edition here on a Thursday. You are Locked On Horn Frogs, your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. That's right, Locked On Horn Frogs. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, the guy next to me in the box, Parker Ainsworth, <laughs> at Painsworth 512 from Locked On Cougs, covering the Houston Cougars. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. We'll tell you more about them here in a moment. But uh, everybody subscribe to the YouTube channel, all the things. Parker, I'm, I'm curious. When Houston hired Willie Fritz, I, I can't say I was excited for them because they're a Big 12 you know, team. But I was like, that's a really good hire. This is a good fit. I think he'll do well there. We're five weeks in. They're one and four. What are the vibes like? Are people saying, hey, this is just typical kind of year one rebuild type of thing? Are there folks that are already like, this dude doesn't know what he's doing? He's in over his head. What is, what's the temperature of the Houston fan base right now? You know, Stephen, I wish it was consistent. I feel like there's kind of, a bunch of different corners and people are really digging their heels into one they're picking. There's one group, like you're saying, that's like, this is the reason the guy never had a job higher than the group of five. It's a big time football play. Da, 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 da. Right. There's a group of people saying, listen, it's year one. Tulane took a handful of years through a pandemic. Give it time. There's a handful of people saying, well, look, the defense is already pretty strong. The offense is falling behind. It's the offensive coordinator's fault. I feel like, you know, every time a football team is bad, everyone hates the quarterback, so that's nothing new. Um, I, I really think that it's it's a bunch of different angles, and the longer it goes on, the more cemented people feel in that, right? Like, they just feel like, oh, I'm, I'm right every time because they keep losing football games. So this offense, I mean, I, I talked yesterday on the show about the Houston offense versus the TCU defense. It's kind of a matchup of weaknesses, and that might tell the story of this ball game, but – it's odd to me because I look at the stats, Parker. It seems like they're running the ball effectively. I mean, they have a lot of guys or a number of guys that were productive on the team last year. You got a quarterback that's returning. What's going on? Why are they struggling so much to score? And, you know, what's not matching up with the stats and actually putting the ball in the end zone? Uh, you know, it's a couple things. One, you got uh... – Bluntly, I would say I think Donovan Smith has regressed a little bit. Um, he had shoulder surgery and missed the spring. Uh, he played last season, the last couple games with a torn labrum. He missed all of spring practice and all contact. It sounds like there's still some sort of pitch count as far as how practice goes with him throughout the week. It, it doesn't sound good. Um, the transfer they brought in to bring in his, uh, be his back, I was getting Zion Chris. And while I would argue I think he threw the ball pretty well at Louisiana, uh, he's a he's a run first guy, and they really don't call a whole lot of pass plays when he's in the game to this point. Um, and they, they also have turnovers. Freshman running back Rashawn Sanford had two turnovers inside the ten yard line against Cincinnati. Uh, right after Iowa State scored, like the next offensive possession, three plays in, you know, star receiver Boogie Johnson you mentioned had production last year. He fumbles in the midfield. Iowa State scored a second time. That was ball game, right? Like those kind of moments kind of shoot them in the foot. Uh, Oklahoma, people I think have already forgotten the fact that Houston was in a two-point game with Oklahoma down the stretch and ultimately right. gives up a safety because uh, of a missed block backed up into the end zone. And so it lose by four points in that game, right? Like the there are some moments where it's like they just put a couple more things together or didn't make a couple mistakes. Um, and it's totally it, – it's probably some, got some elements of coach speak to it, but – Coach Fritz's big thing was Cougs can't beat the Cougs, and it feels like every single Saturday night, this week's a Friday night, but every single Saturday night we've been sitting there saying, well, dang it, the Cougs beat the Cougs again. <laughs> like it, it, It's a real problem. We can't score points. I guess from a positive standpoint, I was watching some of your shows over the last week, and Stacy Sneed, he's having a good year um, at that running back position. I know you were like, hey, I was kind of wrong about this guy. I thought he was more of – a slot receiver type, and he's really filled this role nicely. Um, how surprised have you been by just his effectiveness in that running back position? 
Well, so I will say I always I always thought he was a good athlete, and so I. But I saw him last year. He's a really good pass catcher. He's mm-hmm. the kind of athlete you want to get in space. He's five eleven ish, about a buck eighty. Um, and I was like, you know, lose five or ten pounds and play slot. Like I understand that that's what you wanted to play as so you grew up playing, but like slot receivers make a lot of money at the next level and they get hit a lot less. And I thought he was really well built for it. And instead he showed up this year and kind of been certainly the most explosive back out of the backfield. Um, he had to run a 37 yards against Iowa state last week and stuff like that. So if you're looking for bright spots, he's an explosive guy that's had some good production. He wasn't the guy we thought was going to be coming into this year. Uh, Parker Jenkins was supposed to be the starter he may be banged up. They're not doing a whole lot of truth telling on that, I don't think. And then uh, Rashawn Sanford, I mentioned, has had uh, some you know bigger back carries. He's not very big. He's about five nine. He's much sturdier built, um, and so he's got some of those you know shorter distances. And he bursts through the line. He's pretty uh, pretty shifty uh, once he gets into space. Um, See, so, you know they've got a good running game. The deal is when you get down thirty four nothing, you can't run the ball anymore. You know as well as anyone, right? You just can't. We can't run the ball anymore. Right. With the exception of, I guess, Cincinnati and UNLV, though, they have hung in some of these some of these games. You talked about Oklahoma. And it was 3 nothing in that Iowa State game, like, at the end of the third quarter, right? Am I remembering that correctly, Parker? Yeah, the first Iowa State touchdowns was, like, less – it was, like, three minutes-ish in the third yeah. quarter, and it was 3 nothing at that point. Um, and, like I said, then they scored, and then Houston getting the ball right back, and then they scored again pretty quickly. And it was suddenly 17 nothing, right? Mm-hmm. But it was 3 nothing pretty late. And it felt like Houston had a chance to win that game, right? I mean, that's 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 a good football team. They're top, I think they're 16th in the country right now. Um, you know, that's the way it goes. Defensively, who are some of the names that have stood out? What have they done to kind of hang in these games and stay competitive with the issues on offense? So schematically, they're kind of a hybrid 3-4-4-3. Four, four, three. Um and I'll talk about the guy that kind of pulls that high road in a second named Brandon Mack. But the three down linemen are really strong, um, both literally and metaphorically. Uh, Carlos Allen's a no tackle transfer from Kennesaw State. Love seeing him get to play Big 12 football and really shine. Uh, A.J. Holmes, uh, people were worried about him transferring out to a bigger program last year. He stayed put and is really getting to, you know, getting to play a lot and is making the most of it. And then the stud up front, the guy that demands a double team is Keith Cooper. Uh, Keith Cooper came with Fritz from Tulane. Um, Ultimately, I think his draft eval, he's 6'5", 280. He's a big defensive end. Uh, His draft eval, though, I think was all about level of competition, level of competition, level of competition. So he followed Fritz to the Big 12, and he's played really well. Obviously, the games haven't gone like you'd want them to, but he's played really well. Um, I mentioned the duality of a guy like Brandon Mack. He uh, was an old Miss transfer a year ago and then got hurt. Uh, he's a 6'4", 250 kind of linebacker, kind of end kind of guy. Um, other guy up there in the box that's worth mentioning is Michael Batten. I think he's, this is seventh school, if I'm remembering correctly. I mean, he's been everywhere. He was at a junior college in New York. He was at Louisiana Monroe. He was, uh, he's been everywhere. Um, and he's, he's done a lot of work at middle linebacker for us. Looks like he will be back. Missed the end of the game last week with some, I guess, hip cramp, like upper leg cramps. I'm going through the whole defensive roster. I think they've played really well. I, I want to stress the back half's good too. AJ Halsey hits you. Latrell McCutcheon is a good cover corner. Uh, they're on the field though, Stephen, like 35 to 38 minutes a day, <laughs> and and it, you just you can't you know you know football. You can't play defense for 38 minutes. That's a lot of right. time to be on the field. Yeah, that is a lot of time. I mean, that's. I wasn't a math major, but that's, you know, more than half the game. So that's, my, <laughs> that's my contribution to, to this from that perspective. I guess, what does success look like for this Houston team the rest of the year? You're obviously dealing with some personnel limitations, roster turnover, that type of thing. What do you think Coug fans want to see besides hopefully a few more wins under Willie Fritz in year one as this team continues to, to push towards the end of the season? Well, I think there's a couple teams on the schedule that can beat. Um, and frankly, yeah. listeners of my show know, but yours may not. I talk myself into a win by every Friday. So Friday's episode always opens with, here's how they're going to win, because I've always talked myself into that. Um, I, you know, it's TCU is not the TCU of 2022. I'd be lying if I th- right, thought yeah. they won the path to victory in, in this one as well. The truth, though, is that it's not just the wins and losses. They've got to find 
some if they're going to stick with Kevin Barbe as the offense coordinator, and I guess there has been people, has been a corner of people that want to move on from that already. Um, they've got to find some kind of a way to be good at like something you can hang your hat on offense. We thought it was the you know inside zone play to kind of get those rushing yards, but they're not scoring, and so then they have to stop doing that at some point. Um, Donovan's had trouble throwing the football. They won't let Zion Chris throw. A lot of people want to hear about the third string quarterback, OLA, who's 5'10 on a good day. But truthfully, if, if we're wearing t shirts and shorts, might throw the best ball, right? Um, and so there's all kinds of clamor for change because they just want to see something consistently good. Right. Well, when we come back, we'll, we'll flip sides a little bit. But first, one of our important sponsors to talk about. It's Locked On Horn Frogs, Locked On Cougs, a crossover episode. Shout out to our friends at FanDuel. You see them on the screen here if you're watching on YouTube. One $5 bet on the FanDuel app or at FanDuel.com. That gets you $200 in bonus bets. That line for TCU and Houston on Friday night. Frogs, 15 and a half point favorites. Do you think Houston will cover? Do you think the Frogs will cover? You can bet there at FanDuel. Over under, did you say it was 51 and a half, Parker? I'm sorry. 51 and a half. 51 and a half feels really high. I mean, 51 and a half. Parker's really been high. telling his people, takes the under when it comes to the Houston Cougars. <laughs> it's like the Iowa Hawkeyes. Always take that <laughs> under, baby. Always take that under. Uh, so there you go. FanDuel.com or the FanDuel app. Download it today. FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Okay, fire away, Parker. Let's let's talk some TCU football. Well, I got to ask the question. I'm sure you have to answer every day, and I'm sure you're tired of hearing it. But my fans and, and Cougs fans, what happened? Because it was not that long ago you were knocking out Michigan. You're what the only loss Michigan had in a two year window. Um, and I don't mean this like pejoratively. I mean legitimately. Like I I thought of TCU as like, oh, and the sunny thing is going to get rolling. Oh crap, we're going to the Big Twelve. We have to deal with them. And things have taken, even with, I would argue, decent recruiting, a fairly big step backwards. What's what's the most visible difference you see? Yeah, I thought that too. I thought all those things. I spent an entire offseason <laughs> before 2023 telling people all those things and talking about how disrespected the team was nationally because nobody was giving them hype, and then they just promptly fell flat on their face. So that was, that was not the most fun experience. But it's a great question. I, I think, first of all, Sonny inherited a team. Now, I don't want to keep using this excuse for him. I feel like this is really the last year that they can use this. But he inherited a team under Gary Patterson that was very limited in depth in the trenches. Offense and defensive line, they hadn't recruited at a super high level the last few years of his tenure. They sort of lucked out in that they had some experience returning on that 2022 team, and they brought in some transfers. Alan Ali came in at center, did a great job. Steve Avila now with the loss uh, with the Los Angeles Rams, he's doing well there. He played really well for them, um, and so you know they held it together. They had a ton of seniors. I think Max Duggan was an incredible leader and somebody who just kind of willed that team to victory. But Parker, if you remember, I mean, I'm not going to say this was luck, but there were a lot of one score games in that 2022 season where it was like, wow. They came back against Oklahoma State and got a win in double overtime. Um, they had the walk-off field goal against Baylor where they had the amazing drive at the end of the game. With incredible execution late. Too. Yes. They, right. they, they executed what they called the bazooka kick where you just run the field goal team on there, no timeout. Griffin Kell put it through, and they win that game. Um, they had a game against uh, the first Kansas State game where they fell behind big and they came back. So there were a lot of things – that went their way. And in my mind, I thought coming off that embarrassing loss against Georgia, they would be super motivated and they would be like, Hey, we're here to show everybody. This was not a fluke. And they didn't do that. I think last year they had issues up front. I don't think they had a guy at quarterback who everybody really rallied around. Um, and it's been kind of a circus since then. I feel like when Sonny got here from SMU, the narrative I had in my mind was high flying offensive coach defense was kind of secondary undisciplined at times. And the knock on him at SMU Parker was they would start, they would get a great start to the season and they would look like mm -hmm. the team to beat in the American. And then as the year went on, the physicality of other teams 
started to wear on them and they couldn't finish like they expected it to. But then in his first year, it was like all those things that I thought about him, the lack of physicality, the toughness, both mentally and physically, they, they did all that. And so I was like, well, <laughs> okay, I was totally wrong about this dude. And now I feel like we've, we've swung the pendulum in a totally different direction. I think 2022 was a perfect storm of there were a lot of guys on that roster who were hungry to win, who had been with a coaching staff that was very tough and demanding, and they had that kind of instilled in them. And then somebody came in with a more relaxed, like, hey, let's let's have some fun. Let's empower right. you guys to, to lead sense. themselves. And they really responded well to that. I, well, I, and when guys are yeah. self-motivated, a relaxed coach can be a big plus, honestly. Yes. Um, so I want to shift sides to the defense side of the football. Um, and I'll, I'll give my reason why in a second. Um, 31 points per game is a lot to be giving up. Houston has scored officially zero points in the Big 12 this year. Um, They scored a garbage time touchdown against UNLV. They scored a single touchdown against Oklahoma. And a lot of people are just not counting Rice because Rice looked really bad. Do you think this is the kind of defense with the pores that a team like Houston can take advantage of? Or is that more a function of, you know, you haven't had the easiest schedule? Well, I feel like the thing that TCU is, has struggled with that Houston could exploit is teams have run the football on them really at will for the most part. I mean, it started in the UCF game. Gus Malzahn was adamant that they were going to use KJ Jefferson. They were going to use those running backs. And they stuck with it even when they fell behind in the first half. And eventually they sort of wore them down. Same story against SMU. I will say, I think they played better against Kansas. They made a few adjustments. Young guy, Marcus Deal, they've put him in the middle at nose guard. That seemed to help. But that being said, I said in the postgame show, I was like, if anybody's got Jeff Grimes' address, the Kansas play caller, I would love to send him a card or maybe send him (laughs) some money. Like, they threw the ball 34 times and ran the ball 34 times. And when they ran the ball, Parker, I didn't see TC really stopping him that much. I don't know why he was so <laughs> eager to let Jalen Daniels drop back and throw, but they did that. And to TCU's credit, they handled it well, and they got some stops when they needed to. I think that's the thing, though. Willie Fritz, I, I feel like just his nature, it seems like they'll be more in tune with, hey, if we can establish this, then let's stick with it. And so can TCU force Donovan Smith to throw the ball? Can he? Can they force Houston into third down situations? Uh, well, I'm going to make a bold prediction. I think Houston scores this week. That's, that's, <laughs> that's what I'll say. Well, that's that makes me feel better. Um, you know, I, a lot of people say don't hold your breath. I, I do think they've been close. There's got to be a breakthrough at some point. Um, yeah, yeah. And Kansas, like you mentioned, I mentioned the schedule. SMU is all right, right? Uh, UCF is, uh, I think, strong. I know they got embarrassed by Colorado on national TV the other day or whatever. But, uh, and then Stanford open the year is another power five team, power four team, right? Um, Dana Holgerson effect. He is technically a defensive analyst. Um, yeah. Obviously, yeah. folks in Houston, um, I don't, I think when he came to his offensive coordinator, people really loved him. Uh, he he left. He came back as a head coach, and there, I, myself included, were a lot of people excited. I don't think I was alone in that. I think there's some revisionist history of people being excited. Um, and then he he didn't really coordinate the offense. The offense was nothing but like we could remember from his first tenure. Um, and things went south, and Nolan paid the biggest buyout in school history to get rid of him. Um, have you noticed any impact? I mean. The defense is, like I said, not the strong suit. Any impact of Dana there in TCU? Well, he's – so, yeah, he's doing advanced scouting for the defense. Um, I I said before the UCF game, I was like, hey, this is the week where Dana could make his money if he can give Andy Avalos some insight on what Gus Gus Malzahn's going to do in the run game. They didn't play super well, so I guess from that perspective – Maybe they didn't have great insight into what they were doing. Um, here's my read on the Dana thing. He did one press conference during uh, fall camp. Some coaches that were former head coaches, you say, well, that guy's really going to struggle to be an analyst because 
he's going to be hands off and he's not going to be with the guys. Parker, I think Dana really likes being hands off. I didn't get the impression. <laughs> you, I didn't get the impression that Dana was like itching to be in the coaching office every you just day, made, grinding away. You just made a lot of friends in Houston, I think. Um, other name I want to ask you about. I could talk about, you know, Malcolm Kelly's on the staff. Uh, there's a handful of guys on the staff that have ties to Houston as well. Uh, we've talked about that a little bit this week on Locked On Coombs, the crossover, uh, like back and forth between these programs and being in the state of Texas and whatever. Uh, you mentioned earlier, though, and I, I don't want to let that get away. There has been a quarterback change from last year this year. Josh Hoover, for all the points they've given up, Josh Hoover is lighting it up. He's got over 1,700 yards, 14 touchdowns. Um, he's he's playing really well. Mm-hmm. Kid from Rockwall, DFW kid, uh, stayed home and played at TCU. What's the, what's the read on him? What's he doing differently than he did a year ago? I think all the intangible stuff seems to be off the charts. Like he's a good leader. Um, I feel like he's putting the work in now, you know, that doesn't mean you're going to be great. There's still a talent level that has to happen. And he's got a better arm than I I thought coming into the year, Parker. Like he's fit the ball in some tight windows where I've been like, okay, that was a rope. Like that was a legitimate big time throw. I feel like he's been very decisive. Uh, He's been good at reading through his progressions, making decisions, They do a lot of RPO stuff, and he's got a good feel for, you know, when to get that ball out and throw it and um, and when to hand it off. And so the the offense is supposed to be quarterback friendly, but he to his credit, like he has made it that way with his play. Um, It's been kind of a weird year. Like he's throwing the ball all over the place. Jack Besh is second in yards in the country right now. He's got like over 600 yards receiving so far. And they moved him to outside receiver at the beginning of the year, sort of out of necessity. And he's just decided, like, I'm going to take that role and run with it. But offensively, man, they've thrown the ball on everybody. Now, I will say, I think Houston's good. And will they be able to do that this week with the success they've had against, you know, SMU, Kansas? I don't know. That We'll have to see. But they've got a good stable of wideouts. And I think Josh is – done a great job of taking what the defense gives them and just making good decisions and making great throws. And he surprised me. I I went into the year thinking a one year stopgap type of thing where he was the guy. And then maybe he's a bridge to like Haas Haney, the true freshman. But honestly, man, like right now he's got me excited for 2025 with him as the dude and with some returning players because he's just been so good so far. Well, we've kind of already hinted at predictions. Uh, you said as far as you think Houston will score, I think that TC is going to try and pass the ball a lot. I think it's probably time to jump into that part of the show here in a second. All right, I don't want to steal your thunder for Friday because I know you say <laughs> you're going to talk yourself into a win, but uh, I guess the Cliff Notes version of if Houston pulls this off, Parker, what's what's the recipe to get it done? Uh, less turnovers, um, you no know, fumbles balls, interceptions, less penalties. They've been having like six or seven a game. Um, and then ultimately you mentioned running the football, controlling the clock. Mm-hmm. Uh, I haven't watched as much TCU as you and your fan base have obviously, but I am impressed with this Josh Hoover kid and his numbers. They jump off the page. Uh, frankly, he, the numbers look like a quarterback for a guy who's won a lot more games than he has this year. So, um, you know, keeping him off the field by running the football will be important. Um, frankly, not turn the ball over because then he can hit you for a deep shot will be important. I don't know a whole lot about this uh, Besh kid so much so that I think colloquially today I, I mispronounced that name. Um, yeah, just it's speaking. spelled weird. I think it's a Cajun <laughs> thing, so you know. It's okay, <laughs> it's we'll Cajun. Hey, we, Fritz is from Tulane. Our backup quarterback's from Louisiana. Like, hey, we're, we're not opposed to the, the Cajun thing. I was just saying it wrong. Um, I, I will say that I think that's the recipe for Houston – is trust the defense, but don't leave them out there hanging and run, run, run. Uh, you said that KJ Jefferson had a big day, and that makes me feel like Zeon Chris could be licking his lips, the back of quarterback that almost exclusively runs. You're obviously predicting very much the opposite. And um, frankly, I think Vegas agrees, FanDuel agrees. What's TCU's path to victory? Yeah, I think, I mean, sticking with the turnover thing, don't give this offense short fields. Like Houston is having trouble 
scoring, don't allow them to have a setup where they don't have to drive the length of the field. And then I feel like they're going to have to be efficient on offense because Houston has had the ability to sort of bleed the clock if they can sustain drives. So when you get possessions, you better maximize it. Um, I'll take the Frogs to win here. I don't have a great read for the style of this game, though, because Houston's been in so many low-scoring games and TCU is is the opposite. So I'll say <laughs> I'll say Frogs win, and I'm I'll say 27-17 in a game that Feels like maybe they should have won by more, but Houston keeps it close. Parker, what, what's your prediction for Friday night? I'm thinking Houston gets a couple touchdowns, a couple field goals, ends up at around 18 high teens, and I think I've got TCU and more of the low teens, you know, 14, maybe even 17, I guess. Yeah. I, I am going to pick Houston. I will say, though, part of that may be because I think that's the only way Houston wins this game is if it is so low scoring. I also I, – I want your take on this. Houston – has had trouble playing in the morning the last handful of years. And Friday night's a little weird. Houston played very well for large stretches of until they all, they almost blew it. West Virginia last year on a Thursday night. Um, Friday night games are weird. What do you, do you think that the short week Friday night aspect, this plays any role? It's not even like a late, it's like a six 30 kickoff local. Yeah. Time. I feel like for both teams, the biggest thing is you're probably going to have to bring your own energy because there's no worse place to play a Friday night football game than the Metroplex where there's <laughs> 15,000 high school games, you know, around the, around the Metroplex and around the state of Texas. And a lot of season ticket holders that either have kids involved in that or just want to go watch Azel or whoever, right? So yeah. I'm not expecting like your typical – Saturday afternoon crowd. Um, and I think that comes down to coaching and who can get their team ready to Dabo said a long time ago, you got to BYOG, got to bring your own guts. Well, this is a, this is a manufacture your own focus and energy <laughs> type of football game, but yeah, it's weird, man. But you know, Friday night, got to get it on TV. And well, and there, there is something about the state of Texas and Friday night light that I wish it were fun. Um, right. I, I do worry. And frankly, I'm glad it's a Houston road game, not a Houston home game uh, because of that. I, I feel like it actually could help Houston that, like you said, a lot of fans, the tickets on game time, another sponsor of ours. It's not today's today's not their day, but it isn't the sponsor of ours. Um, tickets are not super expensive. Mm-hmm. Um you know, I, I I think that this is the kind of game where you're not going to maybe look as empty as it does behind you right now, but I don't know how full it's going to be. And I don't mean that mean. Houston's had their own problems with that. Um, but I, I don't know that it's going to be a raucous home crowd, right? I'm not crazy there. No, no, I don't think it is. And this is – people think this is a virtual background. I live <laughs> – I just camp out by the stadium. Every night I just sleep in a tent. <laughs> and sometimes Sonny comes by and give him advice, so – um, yeah, that's what I do, and I'm proud of it. And <laughs> I love the thought that Sonny's giving podcast advice. Like, hey, Sonny, why don't you get why don't you keep him from scoring a few times? <laughs> yeah, he's a big podcast guy. He loves <laughs> he's always listening to Joe Rogan as the AirPods and just that tracks you know, that we're, tracks. We're talking things <laughs> up. So, all right, Friday night. Uh, will you have a post game show after the game, Parker? I will. Uh, we have a locked on city of Houston too. Uh, so I'm. You know, with no Astros, he might be free. Uh, so that's the way that goes. And then uh, mm. Locked on Cougs will be somewhere after the game. You can follow me on Twitter or X or whatever you call it. I'll be sure to tell you where. We'll at least have a Cougs show. We might also have a Houston show. Yep. Love postcasts and Locked on Horn Frogs as well. Subscribe to Locked on Cougs. Subscribe to Locked on Horn Frogs on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. We're free and available wherever you get your podcasts.